Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm really excited to have Rose Bowen here today. Uh, last time I met with Don Price, um, he said to me, you've got to get hold of Rose. She's, uh, she's uh, was in the Rhodesian Women's Service, and, um, and we still have comms 45 years later. We're still friends, and she's fantastic. So you've got to give Rose an interview. And uh, so I'm very privileged to have Rose on the line. I'm in Cape Town, she's somewhere in the UK. And uh, so we, we're on a kind of a, almost a similar time zone. Uh, but Rose, welcome. Why don't you tell Thank us- Thank you, John. Yeah, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, your background and how you came to, to join the army? Yeah, certainly. Um, thanks for inviting me. John, I, I was, born to a, a farming farming family. My father was a tobacco and beef farmer in the um, Hartley area and um, did my schooling, Hartley Junior School, then went to oh. senior school in, in Salisbury. Um, after that, I joined legal firms and um, got married at a very young age. In those days, you couldn't join the BSAP as a married woman. So after we got married, my husband was a regular member of the BSAP and we were transferred to uh, Gatuma, uh, where I joined as a wife of member post, a uh, permanent wife of member post in the BSAP. I loved it, um, had my young family and carried on for some six years in the BSAP. Then when we were transferred to Wangi, Wangi as it used to be called, um, the RWS was born, that was in 1975. Um, and I decided that I would join the regular woman's service, uh, which I did. It was a little bit difficult um, at the time because I had two young children. My husband was also fully operational during the war. Um, but we did it. And I did my basic, basic training um, in Wangi. I didn't go to, to one brigade. Uh, which was great. I think I, I got a, a, a very good grounding there. Not always easy being the only woman um, in a one in depth national service company with about 500 troops there. So there were, you had to be quite thick skinned to take some of the, the teasing and the, um, the attitude of the, the diehard, especially the old NCOs. Now to have a woman in uniform uh, for the first time ever in the history of the Rhodesian army was something that a lot of them didn't didn't take to too kindly as I say especially the old NCOs and when it came to being a member of the WOs and sergeants mess well I mean that was just something else um, but this was short-lived um, it wasn't long before you know I was I like to believe I was part and parcel of the whole thing um, I served at one end up um, running the admin for the company um, and going into the operational areas, um, Big Falls, Binga, and Bike Bridge, to deal with uh, dis disciplinary trials. Um, and also, I started a, a forum whilst in Wangi with um, the families of serving members um, who, I mean, we didn't have mobile phones in those days, and, and telephone system was not always that reliable. Um, in long distance. So I would have daily radio comms, which I was fairly proficient in from my BSAP days. Um, daily comms with, with the operational company, wherever they were, and then I would pass on, you know, the good news to the families. Um, I think this this proved to be a morale booster both for the troops and and for the for the families. Mm -hmm. Um, their families couldn't always get to a telephone to phone home and say, how are you and all the rest of it. So, yeah, that that was good. Um, one in depth, I served under, um, they were then Majors Peter Mincher and Don Price. Um, I think it speaks for itself that, yeah, 45 years later, um, I am still in touch with, with Don and with Peter and his family. Um, and that I can honestly say was was my introduction into Rhodesian, the discipline and the professionalism of the Rhodesian army. Um, they were they were probably the the best the best officers that I ever served under, and I served I served under many. Um, but yes, of course, there were others. There were no there was no bad officer really. 
um, Don and, and Peter Mincher were, as I say, remain good friends today. Um, from one in depth, um, I learned many aspects of what my duties would be in the future. I think living in the, the sort of operational areas, um, there were news of uh, injuries to troops, terrorist contacts, uh, there were death messages, there were um, very unpleasant side of, of duties to do. Um, but there were also there were also good times. It was a it was a good setup. Um, my duties were mainly admin, general secretary, private secretary to to the OCs that that were in um, command at the time. Um, from one end up, I went to uh, four end up, which was a couple of miles away. That was at that stage under the command of uh, Major Sean Van Strans. Um, and my duties were basically the same there. They were they were jock meetings, joint operations centre meetings at the forward airfield um, in Wangi as well, which were run by um, squadron leaders Wright and Tudor Thomas. Um, again, it was it was new for everybody to have a woman in uniform for the first time. So, you know, they had to get used to to the whole idea as well. Um, they were, they were lovely times. I mean, for Indep at that stage had their company mascot was a lion cub called Shumba. And Shumba was the most adorable animal. I mean, he, he was tiny and he was spoilt by everybody. And But Shumba grew as lions do. And um, I... I had an encounter with him one morning. I was going to work at Four Indip. I didn't know, but over the weekend, they had put um, speed bumps throughout the camp. And I went to work early in the morning in an army Land Rover, um, went bumbling through the Four Indip and hit one of these speed bumps. Well, I thought I'd broken the half shaft. I mean, it made, you know, I wasn't speeding, but it was going a hell of a lot faster than what I would normally do if I if the speed bumps went there. Anyway, I stopped the, the Land Rover. It was winter and I had my winter greens on, got out the Land Rover and unbeknown to me, Shumba was hiding um, near a munitions dump where I had stopped. And as I got out the Land Rover, she, he came for me. And on his hind legs, um, he was probably about six foot tall, you know, put his two paws on my shoulder, ripped my uniform with his nails, and of course, I was just a gibbering idiot at this lot. It was I didn't know that he was there. His handler was was sort of around and about. But um, yeah, I, I have the most amazing stories of my children when they were little feeding Shumba ice cream and things like that. He was just a beautiful animal. But of course, as these things happen, they got big and they get out of hand. So he had to be given back to to the farmer who'd uh, given him to us. <laughs> Um, for Indep, um, I did a lot of a lot of liaison work um, at the forward airfield one at the Jock Jock Centre, which was good. Um, another one, which was I think, tried the, the guys were always ready to make a laughing stock of me and to in in good in good jest. I mean, it, nothing was 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 done in a nasty way, but they explained to me that I had to do training of what they called a hot extraction which is if troops are under heavy fire in the bush, um, they would send the chopper in and drop a, a rope with a, a rod at the end of it. And, and that way, two, uh, two soldiers could be lifted out, one hanging on to, to either end of this, this pole, sort of like a trapeze pole. And I wasn't too keen on this, this lot. I'm not very good with heights anyway. Anyway, they said, no, well, we'll do, we'll do a normal extraction. We'll drop the rope, the rope to you, you get into a harness and then we'll take you back to camp, which is what they did. But they didn't tell me they were going to drop me into the swimming pool when we got to FAF1, um, much to the, the hilarity of, of most people. Um, yeah, it was good fun. You know, we, we did one of our, um, I'll get onto that a little bit later. From Foyndep, um, my husband was then transferred to um, Essex, Essexvale, um, Escudini as it's called now. He went there as, as member in charge and I automatically went to the One Brigade Battle School. Um, this was a national service camp um, under the command of Major Dave Drake. Um, again, with about well, 500 troops there. 
um, I was the only the only woman. I did take over from a Corporal French, who was Colonel French's daughter. Um, and uh, I was, again, in charge of orderly room and camp maintenance, uh, camp um, administration. Again, it was it was great. Uh, you know, the, the respect um, that was afforded me was was unbelievable. It was second to none. Um, I wanted to go on an officer selection course, which I did. Um, not the course, the board, the OSBE. And I went on that at KG6 Barracks, which was successful. Um, after that, uh, it was the officer's course was for six weeks at the School of Infantry. And it was impossible for me to go away and leave my young family for six weeks, um, especially with my husband being operational. Um, so unfortunately, I couldn't do the actual officer's course at the School of Infantry. But um, I got the, the rank of uh, WO2 which was another milestone, um, but it was, it was good fun. Um, One Brigade Battle School was a huge learning curve with, with the National Servicemen. And when the, that was in, oh, when was that? That was in, I think that was 1978 um, that I went to, to the Battle School. Um, that was, it remained the battle school until such time as the new government, uh, the government of Rhodesia changed uh, when it became Zimbabwe Rhodesia for a short, a short period. Um, and at that time, Major Drake stood down, the national servicemen all stood down um, and the camp was taken over within 36 hours of the Zipra tank regiment under the command of Dumiso Dubengwa. Again, I was the only woman and the only European at that stage. And we all know the holy grail of our parade squares in the army that, you know, the, the discipline that's attached to that. Within 12 hours, this tank regiment had ripped up um, the parade ground. They weren't, they weren't a disciplined lot. Um, I, my mind is a little bit foggy as to how many tanks there were. Um, I know it was big news that these tanks had come across the, the Vic Falls Bridge and the safety of the weight of them at the time, but there were a lot of them. Um, and there were in excess of 500 Zipra troops there. Um, my first morning at the One Brigade Battle School, I got out of my vehicle and was promptly wolf whistled by a group of these ill-disciplined troops. Anyway, I, I called them up. I stood my ground and called them in and, and they, were, they were all not charged, but they were read out the riot act um, about their, I was senior to them anyway, but it didn't matter what rank they were, they had no discipline. Um, I put it mildly, I wasn't very happy about serving at the, the One Brigade Battle School anymore. Um, I didn't think it was, it was safe for me to be there more than anything else. And um, one brigade under the command of um, Mike Shute, Colonel Shute also gave instructions immediately that I was to be transferred to uh, Shaw Barracks at Balabala under the able command of Lieutenant Colonel Peter Danes. I say that with a smile on my face, what a character, what a character and what a professional soldier he was. Um, and I, I remained at Balabala until I took um, early retirement, uh, which was in 1981. I must say, though, that I view my army service with extreme pride um, and fondness. It, I can't say enough, but I guess as one gets older, you realize just how young our soldiers were, how young that army was and how unbelievably responsible um, they had to be. That, that was it and it was, it, it was an army of, of kids, but they were, they were very, very brave kids. Um, I, don't, I don't have any, any bad memories, except obviously the, the sad times that a war situation brings. 
But um, another very amusing situation that we had, um, our company sergeant major at One Indic um, was due to get married on the 1st of January of whatever year it was. And uh, he requested that um, obviously his guard of honor included myself and um, a corporal RWS that I had in the orderly room amongst a few other members. And being the 1st of January, I don't think anybody had been to bed after the New Year <laughs> festivities the night before. Um, it was scheduled that the reception would take place on the booze cruise on the Zambezi River. Um, but due to terrorist activity the night before, that, that was not possible. The Guard of Honour carried on. Um, the church the church smelled like a brewery. Uh, it, was, it was scary, absolutely scary. You didn't have to go inside to smell the stale booze. It, you could, you could, as you drove past the church, you could smell it. <laughs> anyway, we did our, our, our guard of honor went ahead and it was very successful. And the reception was held at uh, Peter's Motel, at Vic Falls, Peter's Motel. And we all went in there and it was very, very jolly and very, very happy. And when it came to the speeches, uh, the groomsmen of our CSM, who I think should probably remain nameless at this stage, <laughs> um, the groomsman was a, 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 a naughty guy, his surname Kirkham. <laughs> and in his speech, he told one of the crudest jokes I've ever heard in my life. Now, the, the groom's mother, um, no, the groom's wife and her mother, so his wife and, and his, her, his newfound mother-in-law. The bride. Um, <laughs> yeah, perhaps the bride and her mother yeah. were, were, I don't know, I wouldn't say they were prudes, but they, they probably weren't too used to the heavy army humour. And certainly not in the condition that, that most of the people were in on the 1st of January. And Kirkham stood up and he gave the speech of his. Um, and in it, he told this, this joke. Well, the bride and her mother left. <laughs> they got up and they left the reception. The party carried on. You know, the, the groom was there and everybody was there except the bride and her mother. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they were oh my god it i can't tell you how how funny it was it ended up with all the the um god of honor changing uniforms and and you know it was it was just fun but um there were a few tense moments when when the bride and and her mother were missing um i've subsequently seen that company sergeant major many years ago in johannesburg and we we had a good giggle of, about that, but um, it wasn't very really funny for him at the time. I think it was his first big domestic dispute after he got married. I've certainly never experienced where a, where the bride has left left the reception in disgust before. <laughs> <laughs> what also what um, also amazes me, Rose, is, is how much we could drink when we were younger. <laughs> I can't do that anymore. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to comment on that. I'm not going to comment <laughs> okay, on that at all. <laughs> I'll cut that out. <laughs> just, just, <laughs> but it, you know, getting back to, it just shows you what a small world this was. When, when I was at One Brigade Battle School, um, we, at, at a certain stage before um, Zim, Rhodesia became Zimbabwe Rhodesia and before the, the takeover of the Zipra forces, the monitoring forces were, were there shortly before that. And there were some, some pretty senior British forces that came out, one of which was a, a Major General, Jay Ackland, who was a very nice man and um, typical British officer. And um, I didn't get to know him that well. I was a mere W02. So, I mean, you know, we were not up to that sort of echelon of of socializing, but um, of course I had dealings with him. Um, and then of course we lost all contact. When I first came to the UK in 2007, 
I was on a work assignment in a place called Porlock Harbour um, in Somerset. And um, I was working for a very well-heeled historical family. Um, he had, he was a sir, he'd served in the British Army, he'd been wounded three times during the war, um, got the medals to prove it, and lovely, lovely family. But they used to have very posh luncheons, and it, part of my duties was to make sure that um, the table for, for 18 or 20 people was correctly set and, and the food was all, and I was like a maid of honor, really. <laughs> Anyway, the first luncheon I ever did, I saw the guest list and who was on it, but made um, this, what it used to be Major General Jay Ackland. And I said to, to my hostess, <coughs> you know, this is not the, the Major General Jay Ackland from long ago. She said, oh yes, and she was related to him. Anyway, they sat him next to me at the lunch table. Um, and he did, of course, he remembered his service in, in Rhodesia and, and it was just wonderful to, to reminisce after all those years. And he, he still, you know, still had a vivid, vivid memory of, of his times in, in Rhodesia. Absolutely fantastic. Wonderful. But yeah, um, and another, another lighthearted moment um, of my service. Again, it was Air Force. Um, it, they said it was compulsory that I had to go out and do some um, training in choppers and relay change of the radio stations and whatever, which I did. Um, always, I, I mean, I was the only woman, but um, it, that didn't make any difference. Uh, so we used to go out and do relay change. And, and on the one relay change, they said, when you come back, um, the they're going to go through the actions of doing an auto rotate. Well, I had no idea. <coughs> Excuse me. No idea of what that was. Um, so we went out, did the, the relay change, and uh, I soon learned what the auto rotate was. <laughs> I don't know what. <laughs> don't know what height we were at, but the pilot and the guy sitting next to him, I was in the back of the chopper. There were no doors on the chopper or anything else. Um, I could see the pilot chatting to the guy next to him and eyes tell a fortune of stories. And I could see that they were laughing. So I couldn't hear a thing, but they were up to some no good, but I, I had no idea. I was totally, totally innocent. And the next thing he did the auto rotate. Well, I soon learned that auto rotate was when they switched the engine off and you just auto rotate down towards the ground at one hell of a speed. I don't think I've ever held on so tight in all my life with no doors on this chopper to the extent that I actually pulled the muscles in my arms. Sure. I thought it was the end. I really thought that the, the, the motors on the chopper had gone, but this was, you know, this was part of their the action fun that they had, much at my expense, of course. Um, I think the funniest, the funniest happening that I had ever experienced, I'd only been in the army some a couple of weeks and I had to go down to one brigade um, for various lectures and whatever, it was a Saturday morning and uh, Whenever, because we had we had convoys and we, there were curfews and whatever on the main roads, the Air Force <coughs> were very good. They used to go, I think, I don't know how often, but certainly every, once a week for resupply purposes to, to one brigade or to Bulaway. So it was suggested that I go down with the resupply flight. Saturday morning, six o'clock, be at the, the forward airfield. There'd been one almighty social at four in depth the night before. So as you say, you know, you can drink a lot when you're much younger and, and nobody was very shy in, in refusing drinks in those, in those days. So there were a lot of hangovers, but the Air Force cook um, got onto the flight, um, this little plane, I don't know what it was, um, smelling of bacon and egg. Uh, when you're not very good in the air, and you've got a bit of a hangover, the smell of food doesn't go down too well. <laughs> well, I was feeling a little bit green before we took off, but just shortly after we took off, 
the pilot who was a commissioned officer in the Air Force, thought that he would be very obliging and he would he was going down low into into Huangi National Park. As soon as he saw a herd of elephant or buffalo or whatever it was, he would fly low to show us and whatever. Well, that d- ducking and diving, can you imagine what that does to your stomach when you're not feeling on top of the world after a hell of a party the night before? I knew that I was going to disgrace myself. I knew it. I could, <laughs> was starting, starting to feel nauseous like you cannot believe. Before I could do anything, there was only one sick bag on that flight and the Air Force cook grabbed it. He did his little bit with all the sound effects to go with it. And when when I saw that, that was me gone. And I looked around for another sick bag. There was none. The only possible receptacle in that plane was the pilot's cap. <laughs> and I thought I was a very junior, very junior member of the, the RWS at that stage. And I thought, no, this, this is worth more than my career for me to take the pilot's cap and, and deposit my lot in there. So I did the honorable thing and I grabbed the sick bag from the, the Air Force cook. And we shared that bag all the way to Brady Barracks. Him and I, fortunately, the one was managed to to keep in what he had to keep in or what I had to keep in while the other one was depositing and vice versa. And I think by the time we got to to one brigade, it was the only time in my army career that I've ever had to pull rank on anybody. (laughs) And he he was junior to me, but he was the last one to use that bag. And I said to him, no chance am I taking that off the plane. But now it was almost overflowing. He took it off. Well, that story went around the camps. I I don't think my OC, who was Don Price at the time, I don't think he was very proud of of this woman that was going to be his his professional RWS, having having disgraced myself on that flight. (laughs) Oh, wonderful story, yeah. Yeah, I still, you know, I still laugh about it now. And I can still picture, all these years later, I can still picture that. That poor Air Force cook. You, you don't you don't get many. Well, there weren't many thin cooks in the military in those days. I don't know what it was. They made, they had to try all the food. I think that was their excuse. Um, and this guy was was no different. But oh my God, I can picture him like like I could see him, saw him yesterday. Um, must admit, the flight coming back, I did ask the pilot not to not to dive bomb any herds of game. And he said, oh, didn't you enjoy it? I thought I was doing you a favor. I said, yeah, you did us a huge favor. <laughs> <laughs> Getting back to your life, one's life in, in the operational areas. Um, my daughter was away. She was away at boarding school at the time. Um, but our son, he was he was at rep school in, in Bulawayo. And he used to, as all the kids do when they come home for weekends and, and, you know, a couple of days during the holidays, they like to bring a friend, which he did, which was also the the son of a police family who lived in Kwekwe at the time. Anyway, um, Scott asked if he could bring Adam Hurd home for, I don't know, it was a long weekend. And of course, we said, we said yes. Our home in Essex Vale was There was only one married accommodation there. There were single quarters and then there was one married accommodation, which is what we had. Um, And in between our home and the the main police buildings, the the African police had planted a field of maize. And the one day, I didn't didn't see what these Scott and his mate were up to. They were probably about about eight, eight or nine years old. So, you know, at that mischievous age, and I just heard the wailing of one or two African police wives in the middle of these this, this maize field. And you know, anybody coming from from Rhodesia or that part of the world, you you know how the woman can wail the mai a mai at the top of their voice. A mai means your mother, um, I think. Mm. 
And I went out and there, I have a photograph of Scott and Adam dressed as terrorists. They had blackened their skin. They had pieces of camouflage that they'd made into some sort of a, a uniform and, and hats. And they just, they looked like real little terrorists. And they'd ambushed this woman who was, you know, cleaning up her maize ma ma field and taking out the, the, the weeds and whatever. And they'd ambushed her and given her a fright of course she'd just seen these two kids you know, all blackened and dressed up as, as terrorists. And I think they had broom handles as their weapons, you know, and <laughs> imitating sort of automatic rifle fire and, and whatever. Yeah. But, you know, these kids didn't know any different. That's the, they were brought up in a, in a war situation. Um, and that was their fun. You know, other kids play with, with dinky toys and whatever. Scott did have dinky toys. Um, but he would, the first time we, we went on an overseas trip and brought back him some beautiful, beautiful um, model dinky toys as a thing. And the, the couple of days later, he produced one of them and it was flattened, absolutely flattened. And of course, he got into trouble. He was disciplined for that. And he said, uh, I said, what, what happened to your, to your truck? What happened? He said, mom, it hit a landmine. <laughs> He had seen the vehicles coming into the camp that had, yeah. you know, had hit landmines and were just in pieces. Yeah. And that was, you know, that was what his, his truck had to look like. <laughs> so, yeah, the humorous, the humorous times, they, you have to think about those amongst all the, you know, the bad times of, of a war situation. Mm -hmm.